Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> Jeff, I know you went. Do I say? No, 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 I will not say it. I will not say it. But yeah, so it's good to have you, sir. And, um, you know, a lot of people, if I may start, really look up to you in a way because, uh, uh, you know, when we see you in the papers, Forbes magazines and all that, uh, we're like, wow, how did Vimal get there? But maybe briefly, I know it can be a, a, a lot to say, what's your word on how your journey has been, if I may just put that open to you? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Maina. Good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me on this uh, season two. Yes. Um, well, it's been a 36-year-old journey, right? 35 years now, uh, when we started our company called Bitco. But before that, I can go back, uh, you know, being born in Nyeri, came to Nairobi. Yeah. Um, Nyeri Primary School and then Harris Primary School, mm -hmm. Tumori High School. Yeah. And then I wanted to go overseas for studies, but my mom says, nothing doing. <laughs> Went to USIU and uh, graduated in Kenya, USIU. Wow. And uh, while at university, sort mm. of uh, worked with American life insurance, selling um, life insurance to people mm -hmm. and telling people that, you know, someday you may pass on and therefore you need to cater for something and, <laughs> and nobody wants to talk to you. So you have a whole system, you're trained for it. Yeah. 100 prospects, you get three to five successes, and everybody wants to postpone. So I think we all postpone our last day, you know, and all that Yeah. So it came out very clear that, you know, this is not something that I want to do. Yeah. Because you, know, you go prospecting and then you do a lot of that stuff. Um, and meantime, my father was in the clothing business, um, Bitco Clothing Factory, that he used to run. Bitco, the name comes from his name. His name is BD Shah. Oh. So oh. BD Company. Okay. And that's how it was existing in, in Bitco Clothing Factory. And um, looked at that business and said, while in university, he said, okay, I was doing my um, bachelor's degree in business administration mm -hmm. and uh, looked at s seeing how we can take it further, take it to the next level. And from making garments, right, shirts, trousers, stuff like that, so we can take it backwards into, into cotton yeah. and see how we can go back into making the textile itself and then mm -hmm. looking at the farming and seeing how we can look at cotton. Yeah. So I did a university study and one of my course was to see, to look at the value chain. And the entire value chain went from making garments to, uh, you know, textiles, weaving, spinning, and then ginning. Mm -hmm. uh, ginning means cotton, right? Yeah. <laughs> you take cotton from the farm, you gin it, you get lint. Lint is the one that we use for clothes. Mm -hmm. And then you get something called seeds, cotton mm -hmm. seeds. And charted the whole value chain out. So the seed side would have a system whereby you, you crush seeds, you take the seeds from the, from the plant. The seeds are then crushed for oil, cotton seed oil. Yeah. And then the byproduct, whatever is left over, goes to animal feeds. Mm -hmm. right? And that's what you get for animal feeds. And charted that whole thing out from, so, from uh, the oil that you get. Yeah. You refine the oil and you get refined oil and you get a byproduct. And the byproduct is used for soap making. So that whole value chain charted it out in university, did all that study, and said, well, this seems like something we need to do. Mm -hmm. So we, we went ahead and said, let's look at farming, right up to farming. Yeah. Um, we held a few barazas with farmers, cotton farmers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And we took a few cotton seeds and talked to them. And all they said is, give us a seed and we shall plant. Mm -hmm. So we gave out free seeds to everyone. Okay. Right. Uh, little did we know that you know there would be no harvest coming out of it. I was not in business. I was in university <laughs> at that time, so it was a pro process to check that out. But ultimately, came out that the farmers wanted the seed, they wanted the fertilizer, they wanted to see where will I sell it and what will I do with it. Um, of course, when you take it from the farmer, you got to take it to a ginnery. So we had to look at that whole value chain. Mm. Um, having looked at that, and I've got a long story short because I could go on for. Two I months. know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We looked at the value chain and saw which one's better. Now, my father was in the, in the um, garments value chain already. So being in that, he studied that and said, look, we've got this uh, white shirt or red shirt like Jeff's wearing or, or something of your type. And you go and give it to a lot of retailers in the market. The retailers say, if it sells, then we will pay you for it. So there was a huge amount of credit in that system. And the amount of credit you need is about sometimes 60 days to 90 days when they pay you. Mm. Some of them went to 180 days, right? They write a promissory note, an IOU, and say, here, we will promise to pay when we sell the product. And what happens after three months or four months? That color red didn't work, black didn't work, stripes didn't work, 
comes back to you say, we didn't sell it, so we're not paying you, we're only paying you for what was sold. So the credit system was so pathetic. I'm sorry, as, as I said, use the word pathetic. <laughs> because okay. it was just like, you keep on giving credit and, and it's all by chance. Yeah. Now, you sell it for a good margin, because governments have a good margin, 40, 50%. Mm -hmm. But when it, goods come back to you, you sell them for you know, 100 shillings or 200 and it's like dead stock. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening to our markets here, where you see the second-hand clothes coming in. These are all dead stocks coming from European markets, which didn't sell there, so they come back. Jeans are, you know, one dollar jeans. Yeah. Right. Mm. So I'm just saying that's the market, and then looking at the other side, which was the the crushing of the seed oils, soaps, and all that stuff. The cycle was simple. It was standardized products. It was it was, you know, branded products. Um, you didn't have any dead stocks, and the cash cycle was 30 days. Right. So you convert your money into into cash from goods into inventory and sold, and you get the money back. So having looked at that, we thought it's better to abandon the, the textile garment side and look at the other one. Yeah. Now we had no experience in that. So mm. we said, okay, let's do a study. Yeah. So coming out of university, um, no other business. Um, in fact, we planned and my father shut down the clothing factory yeah. in 1980. Oh. That's when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, out, out of that, now we'll see what to do. Yeah. So sat at home with my you know, family and, and for two years worked from home, right? Trying mm -hmm. to do the study. Mm -hmm. And the study was done, um, took it to banks. Now going from bank to bank and saying, here's a proposal I have. It's a full value chain going from seed crushing to crush the seeds, oil, the whole lot. Yeah. And um, Jeff, you weren't around then. Yeah. But you go to bankers <laughs> and traditionally bankers are looking and saying, okay, uh, young man, what's your experience? No experience. <laughs> uh, have you ever done this before? Never done this before. Um, why do you think it'll work? I have a plan, I have an idea, and I think this concept works because yeah. it's there. And believe you me, we've been, to, we've been to all the banks, multinational banks, local banks. Our banks were not as good at that time in 1980. Yeah. So all of them would look and say, okay, um, good plan, but no execution, no, no implementation, you don't have the seed capital. So one banker actually told us, um, this was a, one of the major multinational banks at that time, said, uh, Unilever will kill you. <laughs> so we said, okay, that sticks in the back because you know Unilever had this brand called Kimbo and that stuff. Yeah. Said, fine, that's stuck in the, in the hard drive. And then went along, <coughs> along to IFC, International Financial Corporation, and said, here's my proposal, look at this. And they said, uh, young lad, looks like a good proposal, but do you have 40% equity? Now the proposal then was about 50, 60 million dollars, the whole lot, full value chain, from farming into seed crushing and all that stuff. We said the lint will sell it to somebody else. And they said, um, if you have 40% equity, we can uh, you know, look at funding you. I said, I don't have nothing, you know, we've got zero. We want to start and we want to take a loan and do all that stuff. So he advises one solid thing that was for entrepreneurs is start small, aim big, but start at one end of the value chain. Uh, we could have started with farming and uh, take the seeds and sell it to somebody, but we would have failed. So we started from the customer end, where there's a customer at the end. And in 1985, we started with a soap plant, a very small soap plant in Nairobi, which my brother, uh, and my brother is an equal partner, you know, so I go and talk about all these things, but he does all the work. And my father also, Vidisha. So we're a three party, my father and two brothers, and that's it. And we started the soap plant in Nairobi on a small scale, but we looked at what is it that works here. What worked at that time was a lot of people were bringing it in drums, the raw materials. Uh, that was palm sterine. We brought it in bulk. So that changed the game for, in a big way, number one. Number two, uh, we put up a small automated plant, which we could run ourselves, and we worked hard for that. I think it was important. But that took us to, to places. And then we said, quality with a price advantage. I don't know if you were born then, if you remember those blue soaps that they used there, yeah. and your ha hands would go harsh and they were dry, and blue and white soaps, and I think Unilever and others were in the market. So anyway, we did that. It was called East African Industries then. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the soap, we went out and produced the soap, went around to shopkeepers and said, okay, here's a new soap. The brand was Cuckoo and the, another brand was Saba Saba. And we went out to people and said, here, stock this. They said, nobody's asking for your product, so we won't stock it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a soap, it's a better quality. No, 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 Nobody. nobody's asking for it, therefore we won't stock it. And you know, we had these big blue boards, EI distributors, so they can't stock our products. Mm. And that was a big, big hurdle then. So again, to do with traditional business, you 
can't go into the places who are distributing soaps and other products because they're already designated to somebody. And then we went to all the f traders who were with my father in the garments industry who were selling the garments. We went and told them, guys, take our stock. They said, no, we're not in the soap business. We're into, into making fashion and all that stuff. We said, just stock our products and take it as consignment stocks. Yeah. And when it's sold, then you pay us. So that's a, that's a hard start. I'm just saying entrepreneurs are not ever going to have it easy. So it's never like it's like it's straight away done. So we, we improvised that and said, look, stock this product. And then we got some guys to say, let's go from these stockists across the country. From there, take this product to the market. And obviously, we had to get some more people to say, go and ask for these products to the distributors and the retailers. Yeah. Uh, they would say, do you have cuckoo? Do you have saba saba? And they said, no, we don't have it. So then they started to say, there's a demand here. So let's put that. That's up. a strategy there, right? <laughs> cool. I'm giving you the tips and secrets. So yeah, I think yeah, if you cool. pick on that. Yeah. Because this is the same problem every entrepreneur faces. Mm -hmm. Never been done there before, or you've got peanut butter local, or I use imported. There's all those things that happen. Mm -hmm. So we had to go to that route and consignment stocks. And then, of course, we are rented out. I mean, we bought vans. My brother and myself would take separate vans and go out selling to the small, small kiosks, small, small places to say, here it is, try this product. So it was a hard start. It wasn't easy. But I think the issue was quality with a price advantage from day one. Never compromised on quality, prepared a new white soap, which was far better and didn't have any smell. So that was important against the blue soap. And we were quite successful in that because we competed because we had our competition in terms of bringing in bulk. So our prices were lower, so we could afford it. And that was an important point of being competitive. And I use this word even today and say, if you're not competitive, you're not going to be in the market. Yeah. So that worked quite well. And of course, with that vision, the vision that we had sent to IFC was soap and then go back into oil from oil going to you know seed crushing from crushing going to farming and then you know go back to really um, getting a lot of farmers doing that we've been doing that and we're still continuing that for 35 years <laughs> so we're, we're on this round of applause i think that's that's quite amazing i think there's so many things i could pick from what you've said you've said so many things there amazing tips and you know in my thinking I, I, in fact there was one entrepreneur I think they, they must have studied your strategy those days I think they went to textbook center they were selling books and they told textbook center no they told clients you know textbook center wouldn't take the book so they would told clients go there ask for this book and so because of the demand now the book had to be put there I think it's a very nice strategy so uh, I'm taking notes as well <laughs> We didn't have social media. We had no internet that time. Absolutely. We'd go to the office to collect our messages and yeah. correspondence in writing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying the world today is so amazing. It's yeah, I know. And we have some there. Anyway, now, there's something that you've said and I thought maybe you could just enlighten us here. Um, I, I had a script here, but I, I'm sorry I'm not sticking to it. But now, you have talked about, I have you had your brother, your dad and all that. I feel there's something about, you know, some generational way of passing this knowledge so that people can... Uh, if I may call it longevity of the businesses and all that, because, we, you know, research has it that most SMEs don't even survive to their fourth birthday. They die after losses have been made and all that. What would be your advice? And I know NSC as well has studied something to help out businesses. They have something called Libuka that has really uh, had that element of helping out. Jeff, I'm right, is it? Yeah. Absolutely. Standpoint is, what is this that is the missing link for entrepreneurs to ensure that the business don't die with them? I think it's crucial that you create an institution, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it's not about me and myself and the company. You know, you got to make it such that it lives beyond you. Yeah. I mean, even if I pass on today, the, the institution will continue. Will continue. That's important. Number yeah. one. Number mm. two, a lot of people make it more about me, me, me rather than the business. And mm. I think the ultimate thing is consumer and customer. Yeah. Who is your customer? Who is your consumer? Yeah. Consumer is the person who uses the product. Mm -hmm. How you get to the consumer is through your route to market, which is your customer. Mm -hmm. Now, customer friendly is being in the trade, right? And making sure that your traders and everybody else gets a margin, is able to sell your product and offers that they get the pull and the push. Uh, the consumer is where you got to do the marketing to say, I need this product. So w there are many needs that you serve, met needs and unmet needs. Mm -hmm. Now, you may say, I only serve needs that people have. But there are so many needs that you haven't identified. Yeah. I mean, a mobile phone was not a need at that time. It was. We didn't even know what it was. Yeah. Today we use all these gadgets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying there's unmet needs and needs that need to be met. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you can also create needs in people in your marketing, 
right? Yeah. So you create a need that, wow, you need this, uh, you need this app, you need that app. There's so many ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Back then, we had only newspapers and we had KBC TV. If you remember KBC TV, yeah. uh, that was the only media we had. And then, of course, the, the media came up and NTV, KT, and all these others came up and really things started moving. But I think the key issue here is to say, this is not about me. This is something about a longer term vision. So we have our goal very clearly set up. It's online. It's, it's, it's to grab, grow, and sustain number one market share in the African markets by 2030. So I know that we have eight years to go, and that's an important goal. So yeah. you need to set yourself a goal and a vision for the institution you're setting up. Mm -hmm. Not about me. Yeah. But if I die, then this thing must shut down. Very true. No, number one. Number two, you look and say, uh, we, we did that earlier on. We said, what does a Unilever or what does a, a, a multinational have that we don't have? Locally born, locally brought up, started from here, started from scratch with some family money, put together and friendly loans. Um, what they have is a network. What they have is a think tank overseas. They have, they have ideas of how to run things globally. Now, what we had to do is we can't have that on our own as employees. So we started networking with people who have global ideas and you know people like consultants or whatever reading a, a, across yeah. and saying, what do we need to gather that? Mm -hmm. Third thing was governance and really creating uh, what Giuliani calls a board. But you know, a board, <laughs> a board is not just iconic people to say, let's sit on the board and now we have got these people. Mm -hmm. It's executive board. So we never went for the cosmetic board, which is like non-executive. Mm -hmm. You just put them there because it's a good lawyer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a good good X, Y, Z, and just because you want to be ticking the boxes. I think it was important to have executives who make and add value to what you're doing. Okay. And that was crucial. So I think that's important. And of course, having advisors, advisors who give you the right tips. Yeah. And frankly, uh, it's a new world today because there's so much more advice available. You know, Bizna or whoever else will give you good advice, but the execution must be yourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of things we have already, but it's just execution that is missing. Yeah. Therefore, we, we face those problems, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when you go in there, you've got to make sure that this thing survives beyond us. So now we're into three countries and I mean, I can give you a whole theory about being at operations, yeah. being in management, mm -hmm. being a director and being a shareholder. When we start off a company, a small company, you're at all four levels. Everything. We have to do everything, <laughs> everything. right? Yeah. But when you grow slightly bigger or you grow into two different locations or countries, you get out of operations, you stay in management, directorship, and shareholding. Yeah. As you grow even bigger across five countries, you get out of management and operations, you become a director and shareholder. Yeah. So the way you look at things is slightly different, and that's why we've got to change our vision. I'll give you an analogy. When you're on ground zero, you know, if you take on a flight, yeah. if you're on the runway, you see the dust on the runway. Absolutely. When you're at ground zero, when you go to 5,000 feet, that's what I call from operations to management, mm -hmm. right? At 5,000 feet, you don't see the dust. Don't. Your vision is slightly different. You see an airport. Mm -hmm. But then you go to 10,000 feet. That's when you are in directorship. Yeah. Then you see a city. But when you go to 30,000 feet, and that's being a shareholder only, right? That's when you, you see a city as a small dot. Yeah. So you're not worried about the dust on the runway. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying our vision must change in that manner. Okay. When you grow bigger in your firms, you cannot still do micromanagement. Yeah. That's where a lot of entrepreneurs say, I'm an entrepreneur. So I got to run everything myself, and therefore all your people below you are saying, I'm just a messenger. <laughs> You've got to empower people below to take decisions. You've got to get your systems in place. That's where a lot of entrepreneurs say, I'm an entrepreneur. So yes, I love being an entrepreneur. I mean, look at our bank, uh, you know, one of the big banks here, Equity Bank, is entrepreneurial style, right? Yeah. Whereas other banks are corporate style. And corporate style means nothing ever gets done, right? Mm -hmm. It's all going round in circles and you know, whatever. And you see the entrepreneurial, it's like, let's go get it done. Mm -hmm. The risk taking ability or stomaching ability, mm -hmm. uh, the shock absorbers are far stronger. Yeah. So I'm just saying entrepreneurs, amazing ability. Okay. But you've got to then go into execution. Wow. Empower your people, empower your people, my goodness. Now, I had a script, as I said, and I just want to combine just two questions from it because I want to also open up the session. There are some questions coming in online, and if you have questions, please send them over. And, you know, just one or two from the people who are seated in here. First of all, let's talk about government in a nice way, uh, whichever the way it can come out. Uh, so one of the questions is, is that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, and we have had it here, a lot of them feel government is stifling their business instead of really supporting. For example, people start up a business, and we see in other countries, they'll be given some breathing space. Maybe 
I think it's in Rwanda where for five years you're not uh, asked for tax. But here the moment you register, by the next month on 20th, do you guys feel me? Some sweat starts popping out, you know, because you have to do all these things. We're thinking, hello. So a lot of businesses, that's why a majority, over 70%, don't survive to the fourth party. So I wanted to combine that question of what's your advice to entrepreneurs based on that? And the fact that now, this year, in August, is another year where every business, almost every business, gets shaken up. I don't know how you've survived. You've seen so many elections yourself, and you have survived all through. What would be your advice on that? I know that's a mouthful, but go ahead. MC or minor shake. I think the issue is <laughs> <laughs> this is what a lot of people worry about. Oh, government, government, government. Uh, how many of you are entrepreneurs here? I think it's a, it's a whole house, goodness. Great. <laughs> how many times do you go to government for allowing you to sell to your customer? <clears throat> None. Not a single hand up, right? <laughs> how many times do you go to government to say, uh, let me price myself at this price? No times? hand. No, no hands, right? Mm -hmm. How many times do you go to government and say, um, allow me to enroll this customer or onboard this customer? None. None. Right? So, your raw materials that you're buying from people, how many times do you go to government to say, give me approval to buy this raw material? Of course, unless you're in uh, ammunition or whatever. But <laughs> apart from that, normal business, none of them, right? So, this is an excuse that we use. And I'm not saying that government is okay. Government's doing its job, right? They're doing the job of saying regulation, all that stuff, and I see there's a lot of room for improvement here. I, I think that government should come out and say, any small entrepreneur, until you make a turnover of 30 million shillings, you are exempted from all taxes and all licenses. It, it should become a rule. And this could be one of the manifestos for all the parties this year. So I'm just giving you a tip how to get into the manifesto and say, exempt everyone from licenses, from county licenses, government licenses, until you reach a turnover of 30 million. After 30 million, you've got the ability to hire you know, lawyers and consultants and business and all the other people and say, fine, guys, let's do it. So that could be one rule that say, for startups, we want to have a startup nation, number one. Number two, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in regulation. Yeah. We've done a lot of reforms in this country. We've gone from being a you know, national country to now national government and county governments. The county governments are fantastic because they bring you a lot of development down to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. The only problem is they've gone into a cash collection mode uh, of going and taxing you and giving you licenses. It's become a license rush from when we had liberalized. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that needs to go, mm -hmm. right? And I think the governors that come in in the elections, I'm giving a tip to all the governors who come Absolutely. in, if you can go and say, all my small business are exempt from licensing, but you will pay tax when you do a turnover of three, 30 million or more, more mm -hmm. then that's fine. Because otherwise we're stifling. I think Kenyans, and I tell you, we operate in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. I think Kenyans, nothing wrong with Uganda and Tanzania, but yeah. Kenyans have the entrepreneurial ability that is amazing. Yeah. We just got to nurture it and, and give it more, more oxygen, right? This is where government needs to change. Government needs to go back and say, fine, sorry. SMEs, we're going to allow you to grow, make it bigger, number one. Number two, elections. Um, we have this election syndrome every five years, don't we? Is it only in 2022? No. Every five years we have that. So a lot of people, and in the farming industry, we've done some studies, uh, Skepsa, every four years they say, I will not plant anything this year because I'm a farmer. I want to play it safe. We never know who comes in government. Does government have any relevance to that guy planting whatever? Oh. Food, clothing, shelter will always be in demand, whoever comes into power. You're right. So I think this is where we, we all, all get struck because, like you said, uh, unfortunately, the media guys only focus headlines on politics, nothing else. And they don't focus on business. Consumption of goods, consumption of utilities, consumption of everything will continue whoever comes into power. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody disagree with that? We will need lawyers, we'll need consultants, we'll need goods, we'll need books, we'll need everything else, even if somebody else comes into power. Am I right? right? Third thing, ideologically look at all the people who are standing. Any party. Say, 100 people standing for president. Ideologically, nobody's differing from where we're going as a country. So we have a vision 2030, we have big four. Maybe they didn't work or whatever happened. But at the, at the end, their ideological differences are not like, 
I'm going to be a communist and I'm going to take over everything and we're going to grab it all back. Can that happen? In this Kenya, can it happen? So where's the fear coming from? Is it that it's, you know, there's a book called It's Our Turn to Eat, that let's go and, and sit there and it's our turn to eat? Is that what it is? So, so my advice to all entrepreneurs is, yes, there are issues around peace and violence and uh, disruption, mm -hmm. right? That is what we should be worried about rather than, oh, who comes into power? Whoever comes into power, your customer is going to be with you as long as you serve their needs. Yeah. If you do not serve your customers' needs at a competitive rate, you'll be out, outshining. I mean, you'll be, out, you'll be removed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people worry about imports, they worry about China, they worry about this. Can we be competitive? That should be your worry. Wow. Wow. Lovely. Very, very important sections there and then segments there and uh, some of the tips that have been given. Uh, let me just go online because a lot of people are conversing right here. And then I'll come to the people in the house. We have Peter Masharia and Miriam Che. I like the name. Now, let me start with the comment. Moving from one kiosk to another is really tough. Convincing a customer that a product is good is another tougher task. But today, I'm more motivated to keep on. Thank you for that because now they're motivated more. Now, there's a question from Peter, which is a big question to many entrepreneurs, especially about access to finance. Um, so this is a powerful story, especially uh, this of talking to banks and they all just turning you down. It's fact banks really look at viability business proposals. They are more on three-year balance sheets with good ratios. What would be your comment when approaching banks? That's Peter Masharia. I don't know what's your comment on that. Peter Masharia, I totally agree with you. Um, I've been through that same system. Banks are today uh, really uh, in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk to the people in the banks, they want to do things with you. They want to lend. But their policies are such that they are, you know, their hands are tied and they want to eat. They just can't do it, right? So I just think that we need disruption here. Yeah. This is where your fintech, your other people, sorry, even stock exchange, if you've got a, a new system whereby you don't weaponize regulation, right? Yeah. Yeah. What we've done is we've weaponized regulation by saying the regulation becomes an impediment to getting any lending out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, at the same time, a lot of us entrepreneurs do not create bankable projects that have all the ingredients, which is why you need business club or lawyers to say, Here's what we do. You need consultants probably who say, this is how we can present to the bank. Yeah. So bankable projects. Now, there are many uh, banks who come and say, oh, we've got, we can give, uh, one of the big banks here says, we can give $10 million to a woman entrepreneur. But then they say, you've got to be in business and all that stuff, conditions. Nothing wrong with that. Let's go and see what are their regulations, what is it that the, the, we, we need to give them, and then look at that. The problem in the last two years is banks have gone away from risk appetite. Mm -hmm. They have no appetite for any risk because they're looking at where do I make my billions from? Mm -hmm. And they've gone ri risk averse to say treasury bills and treasury bonds is the best investment and that's where their money is going. Yeah. And that I'm sure it's also going to stock exchange. But the point is that money is not being available to people. So there is a liquidity crunch in the market. Okay. And we've got to see how to get this over with and really done because I think bankers in this country uh, are probably going to be disrupted by a lot of fintech, mm -hmm. which is why you see your Fulisa and other loans at exorbitant rates of, you know, 1% yeah. per day. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's high, but it's available. The point is we need to get a middle ground there with fintech. And I think all the guys in fintech uh, can look at that and say, fine, what it is. However, there's one more issue there. And I think that's a default rate on fintech. Mm -hmm. um, we need to get our KYCs done through lawyers or whatever and do it faster on a digital basis. So the room for improvement there is, do we have more appetite to lend? Mm -hmm. Can we make our business, so on the other side, can we make our businesses more robust by saying, I have some surety here. Our problem is we do not get lending from banks. What we get is asset back lending. Yeah. If you have land or building or plant and machinery, then they say, oh, we give us that mortgage or charge and then you're tied with you, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody gives you money just for your working capital. And that's where I think there's a huge room for improvement. This is where I think the stock exchange capital markets really needs to work on saying, what can we do to liberate this? Um, and again, make it competitive. Wow, wow, 
lovely there. Let me open up the session now to the people in the house. I don't know whether if you have a question, just shoot up your hand. There's some um, mic going round. I can see James Karundu is here, our residence entrepreneur coach as well. I can see Baraka as well. So if you could start with James at the back and then Baraka. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, great stuff. I am making notes fast and furious. <laughs> uh, great stuff. And uh, two, two, one is a comment. I love the conversation about thinking of the consumer. That conversation leads to the customer. Yeah. Maybe you can add a little bit more on that. Because mm -hmm. uh, I deal with entrepreneurs at a starting point. Mm -hmm. And I really starting to get that we need to look at where the customer is and then find a way of serving their identified and unidentified needs. And out of that, you create a customer. So I'd like to hear a little bit more. The other one is about this movement from operations, management, director, shareholder. How do I know it's time? And I'm talking about the startup scenario. You know, I've started my enterprise, and this is really uh, you know, the kind of work I do, getting people started. Mm. So how do I know? Is it mindset? Is it turnover? Is it a vision? Is it by a particular date? After five years, now I need to move out of uh, operations to management. Just shed a little bit of light on that so that I know that it's time to shift. Thank you. Great stuff. Can't wait for the answers. <laughs> I think she has, yeah, that's a mouthful. You just answer I it first. I have an hour to answer that. <laughs> you I got two minutes. Thank you very much, James. I think the first question is, uh, I'll start with your last one first. Um, when do I move from ground zero to 30,000 feet? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you start a business, you are in all four levels. You wear a hat of a shareholder. You wear a hat of a director. You wear a hat of management and operations. You wear all four hats, right? So I got it a level four company. Then you go to level three, level two, and level one. <coughs> now, there's no indication that, oh, go after one year, two years, three years. No, it's based on your growth. Uh, a, a barber or a hair cutter can never move to that level because he cannot <laughs> delegate it. When I want my barber, I want him. I want, if it's Jeff, it's, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not saying <laughs> If it's Jeff, it's Jeff, I do not want a substitute. I do not want somebody else. You yeah. can't delegate those tasks. Mm -hmm. The same thing with some professions where a person has to do that service himself or herself. Mm -hmm. The second point is, uh, when you want to grow, when you want to grow bigger, <coughs> if you don't move out of operations and go, go into management and move out of that, you will not be able to grow. And that's where the whole art of delegation and you know giving people empowerment and saying getting the right people a lot of people complain i'm not getting the right people mm -hmm. one advice to entrepreneurs nobody will be as good as you wow because you did a startup you did it from scratch you know everything on four levels when you hire somebody they're not going to be good at all that and you expect them to be as good it's not going to happen so therefore you may need to replace you you may need three people Mm -hmm. Somebody with this skill, that skill, that skill. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a lot of people say, I, I'm not getting people. Because they're looking for people similar to them. If they're similar to them, they'll be competing with you. They'll be your entrepreneurs. So I'm just saying that's one thing. Second point is, when you have a growth strategy to say, I want to grow, a lot of people, let me tell you, are content. I'm happy with what I've got. I'm okay, family, da, da, da. And I yeah. can go and drink and, you know, take into alcohol and all that stuff. They're not mm -hmm. going to grow. So if you have a growth strategy, then you move to this level. Mm -hmm. So that's clear. Number three is when you have a vision. I want to do this, this, this. Or I want to do two or three different businesses. Now, <laughs> you as a person have uh, 24 hours a day. That's yeah. what you count in mm -hmm. terms of 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Seven days a week and 52 weeks per annum. That's all you have. You cannot do 10 different things at the same time. So you've got to empower people. And that's when the whole thing of ESG and governance and systems and directorships, you put them in there and say, put that together. So I think, I, I think I've answered your question. Right there. Lovely, lovely. Your second question, I mean, your first question is a loaded question. Yeah. Right? Customer, consumer. Yeah, so let me tell you one thing. The consumer is simple. The consumer is who actually consumes your service or product. So if I'm selling water, the person who drinks the water is my consumer. But I sell it through kiosks. I sell it through distributors. I sell it through shops. Those shops are my customers. So my distribution channel call it a distribution channel, that's what it is. So in, 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 in IT language, we call it B2B. We call it B2B to B2C. So the B2C piece is where you have people directly buying as a business to consumer, right? Now, your kiosk could be called B2C. 
because the kiosk is working at the last mile. They're giving it to the consumer. People are buying directly from them and consuming. Whereas the people who are distributing to the kiosk is business to business, right? That's your distribution channel. So sort out your channels. And I can tell you the disruptors in this market who are the youngsters today are disrupting distribution today, crazy. The same way as you are disrupting banks, you can disrupt banks through FinTech, you can disrupt insurance. If you said, hey, I got an online insurance system, you can disrupt that. Uber is disrupting taxis, right? So there's so many more, I mean, we can go on about that. But that's clear on your consumer and customer. <coughs> All right. So if you're working on your marketing, get to the consumer to say, ah, I need this product. Mm -hmm. Stop marketing to the, to the kiosk and saying, kiosk, you need to buy this, because they don't need that marketing. They don't need. A lot All of right. people spend money on wrong things and they, don't, they, get, they get it wrong. There you have it. He's very happy. He's very happy. So Baraka, you could shoot straight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions was answered as he, uh, as he has asked. But the, qu the second question that I'd like to ask uh, is, uh, as you started, uh, as you have narrated as for us, your journey, there was a lot of obstacles and all that. What was your driving force? What was driving you to be able to overcome those obstacles mm. and to make sure that you don't lose focus on the vision that you, you and uh, you, your brothers and your parents had for the company? Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, believe you me, Baraka, there's many times you want to throw in the towel <laughs> to hell with all this. I'm <laughs> tired. I can't do this. And you make mistakes and you start saying, wow, I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't succeed in this. We've had plenty of those. But what the driving force and the driver there is, the can-do attitude. This comes from my father. My father was, you know, uh, down there in, in Nyeri with Mama, he was serving, da, 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 whatever, doing all that stuff. And he says, can-do, can-do, can-do. We've gone through the worst things, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, that can-do attitude is a spirit that you need to have. That's what we got from him. So all three together, we got that internal spirit because you could have one person down, but the others pick you up and say, fine, let's go do this. Yeah. So a can-do attitude is important to say, fine, we can do this. But also having a vision to say, fine, we can move forward and mm -hmm. there will be a need and a demand. So if your service has or your product has demand, which you see, hey, if people also can use it and all that stuff, it's fine. But if it's obsolete, nobody wants to use it. If you go around selling typewriters today and say, I must sell typewriters, <laughs> and you never change. I'm sure the youngsters don't even know what a typewriter is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, back in the days, we used to telex machines, we used to use, uh, all that stuff, and then the fax came in, all that stuff. So I'm just saying, if your service or product is obsolete, change quickly. Yeah. And we learned that very, very strongly, that change as the consumer changes. Mm -hmm. Because let me tell you, you can't say, I've opened a shop, no customers are coming anymore, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the shopkeepers or Dukawalas are doing the same. Mm -hmm. I've opened a shop, it's in the prime area, but customers are not going. Mm -hmm. Jeff, when was the last time you went to shopping in, uh, in the city center? No Nobody <laughs> goes there anymore, but they say, I've got a prime location in the city center, I've got a good <laughs> shop. <laughs> got it? I think that's important. So change your need or service or change your location as fast as the customer. Now yeah. you've got your customers and consumers see where they buy from. If they're all buying online and you say, I've got the best, most expensive shop in town, you're not going to get it. Got so lost. they're saying, you, mm -hmm. we need to change ourselves as entrepreneurs yeah. as the customer's needs. But you need to know what are the customer's needs? What else can I give them? What I can do in terms of cross-selling? So you can do a lot more. If you're into peanut butter, you can go into so many other things like jams, blah, 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 because they spread it on bread, right? Yeah. So you can get all the spreads. You can do so much more. I'm just saying it's just about your thinking and where you want to go. The other thing is being content with where I am and saying, yeah, Nimefika, I've arrived, Kusha. Then you'll stay in peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Well answered. Now, I, I, let me, let me be a bit one. gender balanced. Oh, uh, Jeff, you have a question. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Because <laughs> I need to leave Bima. Okay. Now, I think when you look at African businesses, um, we sort of lose focus um, at some point. So you start this thing, then you see what somebody else is doing and you hop off. What is the, what is the, um, the strength that uh, our Indian brothers have? Because I've seen uh, somebody starts a plumber, remains a plumber, and becomes a big plumber. Mm. But we lose tr a track all the time. What is the secret behind that? I think there's two things. Uh, I don't see any difference in culture. I think, in fact, our cultures are very similar in all aspects of extended family and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think we become more patriarchal. Pat patriarch, the guy who builds it up and says, I built it up, and therefore I'm the only icon around it, 
and the business suffers and other things suffer and it's like my way or the highway mm. right, that's one thing second thing is trust right trusting your second generation trusting your youngsters or your siblings or whoever you've got in there or your employees and trusting them and saying fine let's take this to the next level right because i must look at this beyond beyond me if tomorrow i'm dropping dead this thing should continue right mm -hmm. creating institutions there we fail on that one number two is a lot of people are uh, if they're successful in business I've got lots of friends who are there. Ah, now it's your time to go into politics. And then they go and start doing <laughs> siyasa and other things and say, me, I've got influence. I'm a Mary. Now, Mary is doing best in plastics. Hey, you know, you become our MP or whatever. <laughs> now the focus on the business is I'm using the business to siphon, sorry, not siphon, but I'm taking money from there, yeah. putting it into, into politics, and then I dead, and end up dead. So I'm just saying that's the other glamour piece that needs to be looked at. Yeah. Second thing is, I think succession planning is a big subject, and I think this is where the stock exchange needs to come in and say, "Fine, let's look at that," because people have aspirations. Mm -hmm. But there's a cultural issue of passing that baton, passing the baton, right? Mm -hmm. And then a lot, a lot of times, I think I would say, as a parent also, uh, parents spoil their children. They give them credit cards. They say, "Fine, open, da da da," and you made it. So the children will say, "You know, I don't need to go and work. I can go and spend the money." They become spenders. And then the trust is lost, eroded, and then say, fine, what do I do with this? So it's not about a one-time thing, it's about vision, and, and there's no real difference in culture. But I just think that we need to make it, make it such that we can take it to a different institution. So if we did that and say, family-owned, family-managed businesses, yeah. I think this, I would say, it's not only in, in, in the African culture or the Indian culture or the Chinese culture or the European culture, it's about let's look at how to make this successive, number one in terms of longevity can we take it and make it bigger right so that if i have i mean a lot of our uh, chains here are doing very well the guys who started with one shop two shops ten shops now you got you know naivas tuskies uh, quick mart there's so many more coming up and they're now learning the art of that the only problem is when it comes to the family discussions there's a big problem between me and mine and then it starts becoming this is my shareholding so we see a lot of that happening we see that even at funerals where you know, at funerals, people say, let me take my stake. But that's a big issue of trust. And I think that's where we need to really bring in some, some sort of guideline and some sort of help there to say, let's make it happen. It's not going to be done only by lawyers, right? It's not just by legal. It's about internal trust. Because I can write, sign any agreements, but if there's no real trust, then I've got to go to court. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Mm. And we can become bigger. I think we're in a fantastic position as far as Kenya is concerned. We've yeah. got a culture, we've got an attitude, we've got entrepreneurs that are really smart. They've got ambition. What's missing is some sort of oxygen being given there. Okay. So that you could call access to finance, access to ability or, or, or scaling up. Mm -hmm. and I think scaling up is a big issue. All right. Uh, since the mic is just there, Rina, and then we come to this other end, I can see some hands here. Thank you so much, Imam. Thank you so much. Just for context, my name is Rina Hicks. I head operations at FIDA Investment Bank. Oh, I want to follow on the succession discussion. What, let me ask it this way. How can we, those of us in the capital markets, make the capital markets more attractive? I want to hear your personal view for companies such as Bitco and even smaller ones to actually see it as a route for succession planning. Um. So the question of our succession planning is not always just family, family, right? Mm -hmm. It's also about if tomorrow I'm CEO and if tomorrow if I am coveted and gone, right? Who's going to run the show? So that's the thing about having, I call it a triangle, having a three person. So every person should have two people who can replace them at any given time. Okay. At any given time, mm -hmm. even at short notice, not about giving a designation. Mm -hmm. So you got to train people, give them that group. You can take your child, child and mold them and say, here, this is the mold that's going to come in. <laughs> they are their own spirits. So allowing that free spirit, but at the same time, inspiring them to say, look, you could do all this too. And we could do it in a different way and we change. A lot of times, to ask also, Jeff, earlier what you ask is, a lot of our old guard are not willing to change. Mm -hmm. I've done this for 35 years. It's worked, so what's wrong? And that's a big attitude problem amongst a young, uh, uh, our older people who say, look, I've done this for so long. And today's youngsters will do it differently. So that's where the whole change management, trust, and of course, a lot of talks like this where we can actually do mentoring for that. Yeah. So say, fine, what's missing? But let's find out the problem and see what is not there. So for, you know, family-owned, family-managed businesses can become family-owned, professionally managed, 
businesses. Later on, succeed yeah. to stock exchanges where you say it's now owned by wider people, but family runs it, right? And it doesn't mean only family. I mean, I can say Kenyans are all my family, yeah. and we can get Kenyans to run this. Why not? So I think that's where the definitions come in. But we could go on. Excellent. I have about five minutes, so I'm going to quickly, uh, the CEO is nice here, then I jump back to you both. Uh, the first thing is to thank you, Vimal, for being uh, a leader in the business space. And yeah. I mean, the work that you've done at Kepsa and uh, at CAM, mm -hmm. and also to be available for situations like this. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Number one, what uh, does Bitco look like in 2022? Mm -hmm. Yes, we know the way it started. I mean, one time I was in Malawi and I was shocked see your products on the whole national shelf in the supermarket. <laughs> That's the first question. I had him talk about Egypt the other day as well and going on. But yes, go on. Yeah. <laughs> so what does it look like today? Because that will inspire us to just get to know about the systems and the brands and all that. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, what opportunities are available to small businesses within Bitco and your other businesses? Excellent. Uh, um, we can talk about that offline, but I think the <laughs> answer is straight off. Uh, we see more growth. We see many more adjacencies. We see many more areas, uh, a lot of digitization, a lot of change management, uh, a lot of uh, uh, serving the consumer and the customer in a very different way, right? Using disruption techniques to see how we can disrupt certain businesses, right? And, and move that. But also many more adjacencies really going to farming in a bigger way, because right now we've only got 30,000 farmers. We'd like to expand that to 60,000 farmers, right? In wow. Uganda, we're doing another 30,000 acres of plantations. So we're expanding on all fronts because we believe the whole globalization is going to change to localization of agri-produce. The time of cheap food is gone, right? And if we can't get our farmers to work on it, and I can say this one thing right now. Yeah. Kenya, we are murdering agriculture. We are not allowing it to grow, and that's a government problem. Oh no. Right? Mm. Over regulation on every single front and we can't do anything. Go and see Uganda, amazing possibilities. So this is where room for improvement here is massive. But we've got the ingredients, we've got the people, we're just blocking it ourselves. But there's so many more things we can talk about. And then for small businesses, many more avenues to look at and say, fine, can we work together? Right? Yeah. We'd like to create 10,000 new entrepreneurs in our supply chain and sell products. Uh, using digital means and say fine why not we can do that so there's a lot more possibilities but a lot of people's mindsets are once I do small I change and they want to do something different all the time this is where you gotta you gotta go and say fine I've got a five-year vision I want to do this make it bigger you'll get it done excellent so let me take those two very quickly uh, just press the mic uh, you'll have to do now a mouthful just take them all go ahead hi hi uh, my name is Jane just for context a uh, question to Vima, you've spoken about um, fintech a lot and like disrupting the banking system and things of that nature. In an African context, um, using your company for example, how can entrepreneurs bridge the gap to using fintech to more access to their consumers? Because we have a vibrant society that uses these products, but entrepreneurs are kind of a bit sketchy on how do we bring fintech into the table, just understanding the concept of open banking and how can we make B2C work for entrepreneurs? B2C, I hope you guys get what that means. But anyway, just go on and let's have the other question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Trisha Wanjala. I'm the founder of Africa's largest natural hair and wealth wellness community. Wow. And my question is about growing to the point of being a shareholder. At what point is it too early to bring on an executive board of directors? Mm. All right, I have room for the... Executive or non-executive? You're already executive, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, when you have a team of, of advisors who know a lot. So non-executives. Yeah. Those are people from outside. Yes, yes. Because you're already executive. Okay. So, fine. Um, I'll answer the first question first. I, I think the whole thing about fintech and disruption. Um, COVID has taught us a lot. During COVID, we've learned work from home. We've learned devices. We've learned everything and go online. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is the speed of everything has gone f faster. So that's one thing. Number two is wherever there are consumers, can we digitize them? Can they order online? Now, we need about two to 300 more logistics suppliers to make sure that from where I'm producing the product, it's delivered to those people directly without a lot of 
take in stock, stock it here, take it there. You know the whole old chain was a distributor, wholesaler, retailer, and they're all stocking. So buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Can we go straight and sell? Now the key question there is, can I know where Jane is sitting, where the location is? That's the digital part we need. Unfortunately, we don't even have house numbering in this country, but we don't know. If I want to locate your, lo your home, I'll probably do it on, a, on, on three squares or whatever online where I can locate it. But we have an issue there. So there's a huge opportunity for FinTech to start becoming available there. So if I have an app and say, fine, you download my app, now you can trade directly with me, mm -hmm. I can give you stock. Mm -hmm. But we have a need for a lot of logistics agents there. And we've got digital technology which you can create or produce and say, fine, we make your product to reach the consumer at short notice. Yeah. Now, the issue there is the payment gateway, right? Mm -hmm. So when you sell a product or when you buy a product, you go to the shopkeeper, I want that product. So you see the physical inventory, you want to take it, before it gives it to you, you've got the payment. So the same thing online, it's the payment done. If your payment is guaranteed, I can deliver. Now today, a lot of people are facing problems. They say, oh, I've ordered. But then when the, when the goods reach their door, they're not able to pay, they have a problem, it goes back. That's a big cost today. Can we get that system done whereby you're assured a payment and therefore all I have to do is just deliver it to you and get it done. So there's a lot of room for improvement. I mean, I can go on and talk about it. I know. Um, at what point? Um, Africa's point largest, point? yes. First question is, do you really need non-executives on your board? Mm -hmm. Or can you do with advisors who give you advice and say, ah, you know what, I'm doing execution, but I need advice on this front, specific domain experts on this area, this area, this area. You don't have to bring them on your board. When you want to bring them on board and all that stuff, that's for Jeff, you know. <laughs> 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 have the cosmetics there and say, fine, I need two or three guys there. But yeah, you could bring in a good lawyer, you could bring in a good accountant. And all they do is, um, important point there is they give you the right advice, the right guidance and make things work right mm -hmm. so again there you don't just want uh, I got an iconic old man and he's good because he's been on many boards but there is a system whereby there's a method to the madness a lot of us in executive position would do things haywire you know run this run that run that and there's no method mm -hmm. the governance system or the known executive will say okay we have a monthly or a quarterly board meeting where we will need to present so you as a executive are answerable to somebody from outside that's a check and a balance on you. Mm -hmm. And that's an important point. When you think that things are not running the way it should be, bring in executive, non-executives and they'll tell you, hang on, you haven't done this, 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 let's get it done. Wow. So it's up upon you to say, I need this. All right, lovely. Time is up because it's 9.30 now, but this side will kill me because I have not uh, taken any question from that end and I have seen two hands. I think it's yours. And uh, Mary, you had a question. Wow. Mary as well, who is a very big supporter of Beastalk. So we could start with Mary and then go to the other end. It's okay. Thank you, Viman. Yeah. Uh, for the good insight. One question. Entrepreneurs, you have taught, uh, you've told us about the different levels that you need to move. Is there a key role that attend an entrepreneur should not delegate. Should not? Delegate. As you're moving from the operation to manager, director, shareholder, what is that one role as the business owner that you should always carry? The second one is, you've talked about, uh, uh, okay, let's answer that one. <laughs> the other one I got lost. It's okay, I have an answer, money. But anyway, but anyway I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you've got a finance person who handle your money. I think the key issue is human capital, uh, placing the right people in the right places mm. at the top level, not at the bottom level. Bottom level, there'll be HR people, but under you and all those key people, that's something that you should not be able to give it away. But oh. once you become just a shareholder and you're not a director, then that role also is given up. So you need to be able to let go, but letting go to people who is no, they've got the system and the trust and you've got your checks and balances. So yeah. there's nothing that you cannot let go of because what happens if we pass on? Mm -hmm. Life has to continue. Therefore, you've got to get, make sure that there are people who can take on this role. So the same way as Mary is playing a role, we play, I probably play 70 roles in my life, right? This is roles, different roles. You play many roles, but you can actually designate and say, fine. When I'm not there, you play this role. When I'm not there, you play this role. So you de delegate in that manner. It's systematic. Wow. Okay. Uh, Pauline? Pauline? Yes. From Bizna, Kenya. Mm -hmm. What is a perfect work-family balance? 
<laughs> there you That's go. That's a very loaded question. <laughs> There's nothing like perfect, right? It's always room for improvement, room for improvement. But we've got 24 hours. 24 hours, 888, divided into three, 888. Eight for business, eight for family and friends mm -hmm. and social, and eight for sleep. Right? Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of us compensate on the sleep or the family and friends and say, no, 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 I'm too busy, busy, busy. So we take these eight hours of work into eight to 14 to 16 to 20, and then we say everything can, 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 can rest. But you need your sleep. So I think sleep is something you should never discount get your eight hours but on the family and the friends and this uh, business side you can adjust that when you start up you are probably gonna adjust fully and say fine we're all into this as you go slightly bigger and whatever you can adjust that but really in your eight hours in a day if you give it full focus you're decisive you get things done you get things moving you will not need more than that but a lot of people procrastinate they sit on it and watch or they play games during the whatever and that, that time waster, if you remove, your 888 eight, eight would be a good balance. Wow, lovely. I think, allow me to close that. Please, a round of applause to him. <laughs> um, so, let me just apologize to online viewers. It's past 9.30, but the last, you just have two more minutes or so because we're about to do the launch. So, Vima, if you could kindly have a seat here. A round of applause one more time as he sits. Well, you must agree, uh, we, might, uh, we cannot exhaust Vimal and we will need you to come again.